Imagine for a moment that it's one week before Christmas. There's an individual, let's call him Bob, uh, who's invited by his boss into his office. The door closes and the boss announces good news. Our company has done exceptionally well this year. Uh, there's a $3,000 bonus. Bob wasn't expecting this. It's unlooked for, it's unasked for, like grace. It just comes. And he says, thank you, leaves the office. Now, what is Bob thinking as he leaves that office? Well, he's probably cheerful, thinking about all the great things he can do with that money. Now the Christmas season is upon him. He's, gonna, he's thinking about how he's going to call his wife and share the good news. And as all of these thoughts are going through Bob's mind, he bumps into a coworker. And uh, Bob says, do you hear about the Christmas bonuses? I got you know, $3,000 is what the boss said that uh, we're going to get. And this coworker says, yes, yes, yes. It's all very exciting. And uh, in fact, I got $5,000. $5,000 Christmas bonus. Now, now what happens to Bob's glow? It dims somewhat, doesn't it? He's, he's not quite as sunny as he was a minute before. Still happy, but not quite as happy. Uh, his thoughts subtly shift from, I can't wait to tell my wife what has just happened to, why does he have more than I do? And that's what happens when you compare yourself to the other guy. As long as we're in our lane, looking at our life, things go reasonably well. But when we start looking over the fence, comparing ourselves with the other person, then feelings of frustration, of envy result. We know this temptation well. You know, you can be perfectly happy in your house, but then everybody around you starts getting a nicer house, bigger house, better house. And what happens? The house that was perfectly fine a week before, all of a sudden you notice, man, this kitchen is too small. This is not, it's not as great as I, I thought it was. What's happening? Well, you're looking at the other person. You're envying them. And that temptation is even exacerbated by seasons when we are uh, facing hardships and frustrations. The temptation to look at other people and envy their life is even greater. Well, it's not merely a modern temptation that God's people face today. That's a temptation that this psalmist, this writer, uh, faced in the ancient world. He looked at the prosperity of the wicked and he was envious, especially because of the anguish that he was experiencing. And so in the first half of this psalm, what we have is this misperception of the world, a misperception grounded in unbelief. First 15 verses. This is what the world looks like when you are envious, when you are not believing, uh, when your heart has been battered and bruised by affliction. But then there's a turn. And so we see not only his spiritual dilemma, but we see how he gets out of it. We see his frustration and bitterness, the first half of the Psalm, but then we see by what means God takes him out of this pit and he moves from envy and frustration to contentment and peace. The psalmist begins verse one with this crucial affirmation, God is good to Israel and to those who are pure in heart. He wants to say this up front because this is precisely the thing that will be called into question by his experience, the goodness of God. Is God good when there is unrelenting suffering? And he wants to plant his flag as it were at the very beginning of the Psalm, let it flutter high and say whatever else is said, we need to affirm that in all of his dealings with us, including in adversity, God is good to Israel. Then he goes on in verses two and three and gives us the spiritual problem, his spiritual problem in a nutshell. As for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. This was not a minor thing in his life. He was on the verge of spiritual ruin. He was facing all sorts of doubts. Unbelief was assailing. Spiritually speaking, his feet had nearly slipped. Why? For I was envious of the arrogant. And what did they have that he wanted? When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Just look at them. Look at their wealth, their health. Look how well things go for them. Wouldn't life be sweet if I had that? That's the kind of thing that he was struggling with. And then in verses 4 through 12, he characterizes these arrogant evildoers. And if we had to sum up these verses, we could do so with two words. The wicked are prosperous and they are proud. Prosperous and proud. Those are not unrelated, incidentally, as we'll see in a moment. 
They're carefree. Look at verse four. They have no pangs until death. They go through life not afflicted, verse five, as others are. They are comparatively carefree and unscathed by the difficulties of life. They are not in trouble as others are, not stricken like the rest of mankind. Their bodies are fat and sleek, suggesting, among other things, health. They're flourishing. How do you like this image? Verse 7. Their eyes swell out, bulge out through fatness. What a great image. This suggests excess, self-indulgence, an abundance of material prosperity badly used. And the people around them what? Verse 10, they, they affirm them. They don't challenge them. These are the wicked. They are prosperous. But precisely for that reason, they are also arrogant. Look at the connection between verse 5 and verse 6. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, because they're not afflicted, pride is their necklace, their pendant. Because they don't know pain, they are arrogant. And that's instructive, isn't it? One of the things that affliction does is it teaches us humility. It helps us to get over ourselves, our sense of self-important, our sense that we are at the center of the universe, men and women of destiny. It helps us to get over that, and it teaches us how to value people, how to care for people, how to enjoy people and not simply use people. Affliction takes us by the hand and leads us into life-giving self-forgetfulness. And if our afflictions accomplish nothing else except to help us get over ourselves, that is reason enough to be patient in adversity. Few things in life destroy our joy and peace and fruitfulness and service to Jesus and others like our arrogance. May God help us to see our pride, to hate it, and turn from it. It's the lack of affliction then that causes, it's their prosperity, this unqualified uh, material abundance that causes them to be arrogant. And then that, uh, that arrogance is further uh, fleshed out. Because of their pride, verse 6, violence covers them as a garment. When you are proud, you treat others with contempt, in this case, with violence. They're arrogant in their speech. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. Their mouth is, speaks against heaven and earth. Look at verse 9. Set, they set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongue struts through the earth. They speak contemptuously of everything under the sun. These are the wicked, prosperous and proud. And verse 12 sums up their situation. These are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. But what seems to be really attractive to the psalmist is just the fact that they're at ease. That they don't have trouble the way other people do. Why is that? Because in the verses following, he talks about being stricken and afflicted every morning. He says very bitterly in verse 13 that he has kept his heart pure his heart clean and washed his hands in innocence in vain. It's been pointless. Their heart overflows with follies, verse 7. His heart, by contrast, he, he has sought to purify his heart, but all in vain. It turns out righteousness doesn't pay. Because in verse 14, he says, All day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. In other words, I've been following God. I've been seeking to walk in purity and innocence. And what have I, where has that gotten me? I am afflicted day after day. I suffer and they go through life carefree. Now we noted that affliction can be good for us. It can teach us humility. And that's a lesson we all need to learn. Affliction is an opportunity to become more like Jesus. On the other hand, affliction can also be a temptation to become very bitter very frustrated with life, and even to doubt the goodness of God. And that's where the psalmist is. Affliction has created all sorts of doubts. And when he looks out at the world, he looks out at the world not in faith, but in unbelief. And this, verses 4 through 12, is what the world looks like when you look out at it in unbelief. 
When you set aside the massive realities of the resurrection, the forgiveness of sins, of God as our Father and Christ as our Savior, you leave all that out and you simply look at the world without these realities, this is the distorted picture that you get. When we take off the glasses of scripture and look at the world with naked eyes, everything becomes out of focus. And everything is out of focus for the psalmist at this juncture. Unbelief causes us to take good things like relief from the pressures of life, from suffering, and turn them into ultimate things. Things about which we say, if I don't have this, I can't be happy. If I don't have this, I'm gonna be frustrated. When we look out at the world without the massive realities of our faith, the result is bitterness and resentment. Things haven't worked out the way we wanted them to. Life hasn't turned out the way we wanted it to. And there is this smoldering frustration perhaps, or a joyless resignation that this is in fact how life is. And even perhaps a quiet suspicion of the goodness of God. Maybe that's where you are this evening. You wouldn't say it out loud. He doesn't say it out loud. He says, if I speak thus, I would betray God's people. You don't say it out loud, but you think it. And God is hard. This is not what I had hoped out of life. There's a frustration or there's a joyless, as I say, resignation to this. That gladness that the spirit should be producing it in us is conspicuously missing. Well, how do we get out of this place? It's a place many of us have been through, you might be in, uh, hopefully we won't be in in the future, but how do we get out of this uh, dark place? What is the path forward? What does the psalmist do? Well, notice in the first instance that it's not a change of circumstances that helps him. This is what you might be tempted to think. If only my circumstances would change, if they would improve, if this one thing were just different, then I could be content. Then I would be at peace. The problem is if your circumstances improve, but you don't, you're still gonna take that black heart with you and improve circumstances and it will still poison everything. Your unbelief will continue to undermine joy and peace, even in improved circumstances. So his fundamental need and your fundamental need is not better circumstances, but a different perspective, a transformation of heart, an encounter with God. And this is where the whole trajectory of the Psalm changes, verses 16 and 17. When I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Have you ever been to that place? I know that I'm not seeing clearly. I don't even know where to begin thinking correctly about this. But how does, it, how does the problem come into sharp focus? Until I went into the sanctuary of God. When I went into the temple, into the presence of God, when I worshiped the Lord, then everything became clear. The fog was lifted. The glory of God illuminated my situation and clarified it. Unbelief is a bit like being in a hot, crowded, no noisy, smoky room and encountering God is like stepping outside in the cold night air. And that blast of cold refreshes and uh, causes you to become awake. In these moments when we are not seeing clearly and our perception of reality is shaped by unbelief, we need to draw near to God in worship and prayer and adoration. We need to seek his face and in so doing, we begin to see clearly. This is where everything changes for him in the sanctuary, in the temple. So if you're in a season like this, whatever else you need to be doing, you need to be seeking the face of God. Give yourself to prayer. Pray the great and glorious realities of the gospel into your heart and don't neglect the worship of God's people, which is what we might be tempted to do when we're in this place, doubting, struggling, frustrated. Don't neglect worship. Verses 18 through uh, 20, the writer revisits the same group that he just described in 412, but everything's different now. In that encounter with God, verse 17, he discerns their end. That is, he looks down the corridor of time and sees their ultimate destiny. He sees what they're destined for. 
And then he goes back, he circles back at this point, verses 18 through 20, and he describes the same group of people from a very different vantage point. Before this, it's like a snapshot of the prosperity of the wicked. He looks at them, he looks at their prosperity now. But now in 18 and following, he takes the long view. And he says, this is what their destiny is. Truly you have set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. Whereas before they seemed secure in their prosperity, now they are in a precarious place, ready to fall off the the edge of the cliff, fall to ruin. They are far more, more vulnerable than they initially seemed. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. They are swept away by the things they fear as by a surging river. Like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. What do you do when you wake up from a bad dream? Whew. It was only a dream. It was not real. It lacked substance. And that seems to be the idea here, that the Lord despises despises these evildoers as phantoms, as nothing. What this truth underscores is God's rejection of evildoers. And this is most terrible of all. For our, our Father in heaven and creator to say to us on the last day, I never knew you. Away from me. There is for the wicked not an eternal welcome as there is for us, God's people, but an eternal rejection. The Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner quotes C.S. Lewis to illuminate the meaning of this passage. Lewis writes, We can be left utterly and absolutely outside, repelled, exiled, estranged, finally and unspeakably ignored. That's the worst fate of all, isn't it? To be rejected by God himself for all time. But that's not our destiny. That's not the destiny of those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. We have experienced the forgiveness of our sins, and we look forward not to being rejected by God, but to being welcomed by God. However hard life was for the psalmist is for you, there is great consolation in knowing that is not my destiny. I will not be rejected by the Lord on the last day. And not only does he see them more clearly, he now sees himself more clearly. Verse 21 and 22. Do you ever look back on yourself during seasons of doubt and you go, how could I have thought that way? This is what it is. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, resentful, smoldering frustration, what was I like? Brutish, like an animal. Ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. And when he says that he's ignorant, I don't think he means that he was unaware of the stuff that he's now saying this side of the crisis. All of this stuff he presumably knew before, but he was ignorant insofar as he didn't see the relevance of these truths. He didn't see his own situation in light of these realities, and he was ignorant in that sense. But now that he's encountered God in the temple, he sees the relevance of our future destiny, of, as we'll see, God himself and having a relationship with God. What this suggests to us, and Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great Welsh preacher, uh, used to say that you shouldn't listen to yourself, you should preach to yourself. You shouldn't listen to that flood of dark thoughts that come your way, especially in seasons like this. What you should do instead is grab a hold of yourself and remind yourself of the truth. When you catch yourself grumbling and complaining and frustrated and cheerless about life, take yourself in hand, go, what am I doing? You've probably done this. God is my father, heaven is my home, my sins are forgiven. What am I getting so worked up about? Why am I being brutish and ignorant? So the first thing he recognizes then as he steps back towards contentment is this fact that his destiny is different from that of the wicked. The wicked will perish, but not him. And best of all, here we get to the climax of the psalm, verses 23 and 25. Here he sees not simply the destiny of the wicked. Here he sees what he has in God. 
Whatever else he has, he has God. He says, I am continually with you. Even in these moments of doubt and sin, when our hearts are frustrated, God continues to stand by us, be with us in all the twists and turns of life. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You hold my right hand. And that statement about God is especially significant in light of verse 2. My feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. He was about to falter and fail spiritually. And what has God done for him? He has upheld him. He has kept him from falling. The reason he comes out safely on the other side of, the, of this darkness is because the Lord has been there all along, strengthening him, preserving him, and guiding him through it. Isn't that amazing? When we are in seasons of sin and doubt and frustration and envy and joyless resignation, you know where God is? Not in heaven looking to see if we're going to make it safely through, not aloof, but present, holding us by the hand, bringing us safely through. We see this in the gospel of Luke. Peter is going to deny his Lord, but Jesus says to him, Luke 22, 31 through 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus is not indifferent to Peter's dark night of the soul. He is interceding as his high priest, and because of that intercession, he will be brought safely through. Jesus is faithful to us as he was to Peter, and through his intercession and work in our lives, he will bring us safely through. When we are brutish and ignorant, God remains faithful. Afterward, you will receive me to glory. We have the, we have the negative side of the coin. It is not his destiny to be swallowed up by the judgment of God. Here we have the positive side. Afterward, you will receive me to glory. On the other side of this life, what awaits him? Not an eternal rejection, but an eternal welcome. The splendor of majesty of God awaits him on the far side of life's journey. Where are we headed toward? We're headed toward the life-giving presence of God toward eternal glory in his presence and that of Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul wrote, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, 2 Corinthians 4.17. At the end of the road, God awaits us and we will bask in the radiance of his majesty and splendor. That's the end of our story. We believe that the Son of God came into the world, bore our judgment at the cross, took upon himself the wrath of God and the condemnation that we deserve, that he died, and having paid the price for our sins, he rose again triumphantly. He is beyond the reach of death. He dwells in glory and splendor. And we who are united to him by faith will join him in his victory. He will make all things new. We will be raised from the grave. And we will enjoy life to the fullest in the life-giving presence of God. How do you look at that, contemplate that, say, I believe in the resurrection, and grumble and complain? that that guy has a better Christmas bonus, that that person's life is marginally better. The hope of the resurrection should dispel all of that kind of murmuring and grumbling. Christ has conquered and we in due course will conquer with him. This should make us cheerful, glad, large-hearted in every season of life. And this evening, regardless of what your circumstances are, you have a reason to be glad. C.S. Lewis, at the end of the Narnia books, the, the last of the seven is called The Last Battle. Any Narnia fans? Good, yes. There's a great community here. Um, very end of the book. Uh, when all is said and done, we're told about the fate of the children. 
Spoiler alert. The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is mourning. All their life in this world had been had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Amen? Is that our destiny? Every chapter better than the one before. This life is the, the troubled preface to a story, a very good story that goes on and on. If that's your destiny, of have every reason to rejoice this evening. And finally, climactically, not only does he have this bright hope in front of him that enables him to deal with the afflictions that he's facing, but last of all, most consoling of all, he has God. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Intriguingly, earlier in the psalm, there were many things he desired besides God, didn't they? The prosperity of the wicked. Oh, the ease that they experience and I have to be afflicted. But he's, he's, he sees clearly now. He's looking at the world in faith and he says, compared to God, what is there? Whom have I in heaven but you? Nothing on earth compares to knowing God. If I have God and nothing else, I have everything. And if I, if I have everything and not God, I have nothing. That's the formula. To have God, to know that he is my father who loves me, is the supreme delight, the supreme comfort, the supreme protection, the supreme source of meaning in life. There is nothing higher and better than to have a relationship with our Father who is in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ. If this evening God is your God and you are his daughter or son, you have a reason to rejoice regardless of circumstances. And may we do so more and more for the glory of God. Amen. Oh, Father, help us to believe. Help us to look at the world, not in unbelief, but in a deep confidence in you and your son, and in so doing, bear much fruit for your glory. Father, we ask that you bless this community, bless the studies that are undertaken here. May they be fruitful and bring honor to you. Amen.